So um, I like to be interactive, and I will share a few prepared slides just to give you some statistics and some things that you can write down. But I'm hoping to end a little bit early so that you all can ask questions, or if I'm standing between you and happy hour, that I'm no longer doing that. So I'm going to share this slide and just speak to it. That the, there's a lot of um, stigma around generations that are entering the workforce that are new to the workforce, green to the workforce. I will call them young, although in my company we don't like to categorize demographics in any kind of way. But, but folks that are coming out of high school and college and they're entering the workforce, I have a high school student, I have a college student, and I have a lot of people in the workforce that are brand new to the workforce. There's a stigma that these folks do not want to work as hard or pay their dues the way that those of us who've been around the, around the world for a little bit have, have done. And so we need to figure out how to harness this workforce because I believe that they can be some of the most dedicated people to your workforce if you harness it correctly. So there's all kinds of um, macroeconomical things that are happening that are causing anxiety and causing concern for businesses. And there are these people that are entering the workforce that have never thought of these geopolitical trends other than in potentially a civics course in college or, or they're seeing a member of their family be unemployed. Some of them watch the news religiously. Others of them are a little bit clueless and think that they can come out and they are going to get a job as a senior vice president right away making a bazillion dollars because that's what they went to school for and invested in their education for. The reality is we need to figure out how to keep and attract these talent. And once they're in your organization, we all spend a ton of money attracting talent. Some of us might go on college campuses to attract talent. Some others have other ways of attracting talent. But this talent gets in your workforce. You didn't hire them to fire them. So once they've joined you, how do you not get annoyed by them? And we have a saying in our organization, how do we make sure that our senior elders do not eat our young? <laughs> so that's what we like to look at. So realistically, what folks are coming out of school looking for, and again, regardless of what kind of school that is, whether that's high school, whether that's college, is they want to know what their purpose is in the organization. And they want to know, am I going to gain tools in this environment? So I was speaking at uh, Harvard Law School. I am not a lawyer by trade. And I was there with a bunch of other lawyers that are working in major AmLaw 100 firms. And I was on a panel about the future of, of legal professionals and how, how technology is taking over. But essentially, everybody in that class wanted to know how they could get a job in a law firm to pay off their debt so that they could go start their own business. And the majority of them had businesses that they were building out of their parents' bedroom already, legal or not. So a lot of folks are thinking, I'm going to be part of the gig economy, but I need some business skills. I need some experience. And we in corporate America tend to think of folks as, what are my retention numbers looking like? What is my pipeline looking like? And so if we start to change the conversation of, you know what, I could keep you here for a really long time, but I'm going to give you so many tools and so many different opportunities for advancement that you don't want to leave because I keep filling your bucket with, with different kinds of upskilling opportunities. One of the challenges is in our organizations, and give me a show of hands if this has happened to you, you work with people that are amazing and you hang on to them like grim death. You don't want them to go anywhere because they're amazing. Nobody's raising their hand. You guys not work with talented people. <laughs> so, so if somebody comes sniffing around for your best person, you're like, oh my gosh, what would I do without this person? And so we have a hard time letting go of people. Talk to your employees, especially your new talent, about what are they trying to fill their toolbox with? Are they trying to stay in your organization for two years? Or are they going to be a lifer? Most of them are going to be two to three years. How do you get an investment out of them? So maybe they want to stay after two to three years. Or how do you fill up their toolbox so that if they leave and they go on to become the next Bill Gates, they're going to give your company business because you treated them with dignity from the moment they walked in the door and you gave them tools while they were there. Flexibility. I know everybody at this conference is talking about flexibility. Flexibility doesn't necessarily have to mean hybrid. It doesn't have to mean in the office five days a week or out of the office five days a week. It means. Are people authentically allowed to be their whole self at your office when they're in the office or when they're at work? 
Do you like it when dogs show up on screen or do you think that's totally unprofessional? Is it okay if somebody is flexible because they are gonna coach their kids soccer league or is that not okay? So flexibility could mean totally different things to people. I've got some people in from my office. I announced on a call, a town hall a couple of weeks ago that in January we were gonna experiment. We've been hybrid the whole time, or not hybrid. We've been remote the whole time. Since COVID happened, we have not gone back to the office. I announced two weeks ago, okay, you all have been asking if we can get back to the office and share and talk with each other and, and be together. And I've been reading all kinds of studies about mental health of people being together. I don't know if this is the first in-person conference you've been to, but it's fun to just be out and about and get dressed and get showered and get on work clothes. Um, the reality is I said in January, we are going to start coming back to the office. Ideally, you'll come in if you're within a 40 minute drive of the office or a 40 minute commute, you'll ideally come to the office twice a week. If you're within a 90 minute commute, maybe you come to the office once a month. People lost their minds. They lost their minds. And so no matter what we say, flexibility is something that people are constantly judging. Is this company aligned with me? So what you have to do is get really granular with people. What is your circumstance? Have you, during COVID, gotten used to taking your kids to school? You can still do that. If you have gotten used to, you're getting your MBA and I didn't know about that. Okay, you can still do that. So flexibility, you've got to really think about what does that mean for your organization to continue to to be productive as an organization, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in government, whether you're a for-profit organization. Flexibility doesn't have to mean we are gonna make the entire organization do the exact same thing. And I think organizations are missing the boat on this a little bit. Career progression kind of goes hand in hand with reskilling. I regularly ask people, what have you learned recently? So I have a personal motto that I live by. It is, I ask myself three questions whenever anybody asks me to do something new. The first question I ask is, do I like the people? Because if I don't like the people, I'm probably gonna hate it. So if you're gonna be around mean people and you're not a mean person, you're gonna hate the job no matter what it is. So first question, do I like the people? Second one, am I going to learn something? And that's where that reskilling comes in. I learn something all the time in the job I have today. My father told me you can have the same five years of experience every year to do the exact same thing, or you can have five years of experience and five years later you look like a totally different human. So you can be in the same job if you're continuously learning. And then the last one is addressing burnout, which we just heard about a couple sessions ago. That's something that we've got to look at. We, I just had a colleague say to me, my health, my mental health, and my stress at work are all this tsunami, and I need to do something about it. And she had the psychological safety to come to me and talk to me about that. So that gets to what does success look like? With the, the new population, I would say for any workforce, but especially with, with young talent, they haven't necessarily worked in an office environment and they don't necessarily have anybody who's told them what that looks like or what normal um, behavior might be in your organization versus another organization. So these are kind of my be specific. What does success look like for you? And what does success look like for this employee? And do you guys have an agreement on this? So number one, be specific on tasks, how long it should take, what you expect them to do, what the timeline in a job is, where you think that they are performing at maximum potential in that job, where they should be starting to look for another potential opportunity to keep their career fresh. But be specific about time frames because when things are kind of in the universe and you don't know exactly when you're gonna get that next opportunity, it makes people anxious. So be specific about your time frames in your organization. If it takes seven years to make partner, say so, but what are those seven years on the journey gonna look like so that you do make partner at the end of the seven years? The next one is psychological safety, which, which looks like a, a weird thing for my hands in, but this is really important because if you cannot ask questions, you won't know what's going on in your organization or with what my, um, one of my friends calls the J staff, the junior staff. <laughs> so if you don't have psychological safety, you don't know what a huge amount of your workforce is saying about your organization and whether they like it or not. And they have leaders in that organization, maybe not in title, maybe not in compensation, maybe not in the room that you're in, but that J staff, they've got leadership. And if you don't give them psychological safety to speak up about what they like and what they don't like, and where they, how they're feeling about the organization, you really are gonna struggle. 
I have a thing that I do called ask me anything and I get some doozies of some questions, but they can ask me anything because I think it's important to know what is on the minds of people that's preventing them from being their best self at work, whatever that might be. The third one is somebody jumping off a diving board. Let them fail. Let them fail. This is really, really hard to do if you're a control freak because you don't want to see anybody go out there and fail. But you've got to let them jump in the water and not tell them exactly when to jump, not tell them exactly how to jump, not tell them exactly what the water is going to feel like. Sometimes they just have to get wet. So, so realistically, you have to let them take some leaps and, and have the courage to take those leaps and, and that you will be there for them if it goes a little sideways. So I think that is one of the biggest things you can do for new talent is let them fail. And we're terrible at that as organizations because we see failure as a weakness and we're, or a reflection of ourselves if we're a manager that my person failed and therefore I failed. Don't let them fail in big colossal ways, but, but let them take some risks so that they can be proud of themselves on how they work themselves out of that. And then the last one is, are you filling their toolbox? Because I think if you're not filling their toolbox and they're not filling your group and your company, they're already looking for another job. So with that, I want to leave a thought on company culture. Just like goat yoga and the things that we heard about from the professor, the reality is your company culture doesn't have to be where everybody is laughing all the time and everybody's kumbaya and loving on each other and having company picnics. Your company culture has to be authentic and consistent. So if your company culture is very much about we are going to find the cure for COVID, and we're all gonna work like dogs to find the cure for COVID and it's serious work and we're serious business and it has purpose and that's your culture, that is totally fine. If your culture is one where we play hard, work hard, have a good time, there's the, we're all doing teams and clubs and all that kind of stuff, that is fine. What is not fine is when you try to combine cultures because you are feeling like you're supposed to have a certain culture to attract talent. Walmart, has a very specific culture. I have a lot of family members who live in Bentonville, Arkansas, so I happen to know a little bit about Walmart. I've never worked there myself. Uh, is there a Walmart person in there? <laughs> so um, the reality is Walmart has a code that they want to make what the American dream in their vision is, that you can access anything that you need at Walmart at a price point that makes sense. And they are super cost conscious. I can tell you for a fact that senior leadership at Walmart lives and breathes this motto in terms of office space, in terms of furniture, in terms of what kind of dinners they go out to, in terms of everything. It is authentic to the Walmart culture at every level in the organization. So I'm not here to tell you what your culture should look like in your organization, but what I'm telling you is it has to be real for your organization and it has to be authentic. The other thing I would say is your culture can be different by department. As long as everybody still feels like they belong to, and I'm just going to use this analogy because it makes sense to me. I went to a college. I was in some clubs. I did some intramural sports. I was a certain kind of major. I was a certain kind of minor. I was in a certain college of a university. Each one of those things had a different culture slightly, slightly. So the Diplomacy and Foreign Affairs Department had a different culture than the French department where I was minoring. But they all kind of worked for me authentically that I could show up to each of these things and they all made sense for the university that I went to. So if your company is ABC organization and you are in the Department of Finance, your department's seriousness or, or room for error or whatever it might look like might be totally different than the sales group as long as for the company, you can authentically define a culture that makes sense for everybody. So with that, I hope I have time left. Do I have time left? I tried to go super fast. Okay, so I'm hoping you all have questions because I live and breathe talent every day. Our organization works with organizations all over the world to find them talent and help them keep and retain talent. We actually like it when people stick, not when people jump. <laughs> if there's not any questions, everybody wants happy hour. No questions? Anybody? Uh, 
Uh, do you have any recommendations if a talent asks uh, for a little bit too much? So, for example, I work with uh, very technical developers and uh, really great artists, designers, and if they want a little more than the company can give them, what do you do in these cases? And more responsibility with, or money? Uh, like more flexibility, more money, they would uh, get back to you as a manager and say, hey, uh, now I want this and so and so, like how about we uh, renegotiate our contract and so on. And sometimes the company can uh, do something about it, but sometimes it's just a little too much. And then if uh, a ta one talent wants so and so, um, the company really cannot give the same amount of flexibility uh, to all of their employees. So you know what? It's funny that you asked this because somebody asked me this recently. Flexibility is coming up a lot. Like, how do you how do you navigate flexibility on an individual basis? If from a company perspective, you can't. So, so what I would say is, does the company understand the purpose behind why it can and cannot do things? So it can be an affordability thing. It can be a, um, we need to be part of a team. It can be whatever it is. I don't know what your organization is. But as an example, I was t talking to somebody from Federal Express that early in COVID, they had everybody going back to the office. It didn't matter what department or where you worked. They had everybody going back to the office because they wanted to be in solidarity with their truck drivers, their delivery folks, and their pilots. And so it was, it was as part of the culture, if they're gonna be out on the streets, we're all coming to the office in solidarity. That's a really specific mission that everybody was gonna be that way. For other organizations, it's as simple as, you know what, during COVID, we all went from home and our productivity went down. And we saw that as a result. So what problem are you trying to solve with the request for flexibility? And maybe we can get creative for you. But the reality is I cannot offer you the same kind of flexibility because we have business, we have business results that showed us that we can't do that. So it, it doesn't have to be mission driven like Federal Express. It can be something, something else. But, but I would sit with the person about what are they trying to achieve and why? Is it just a freedom? Is it, is it whatever? Or is it something really specific? They have a sick, sick loved one that it's a finite period of time and you don't want to lose that talent. So it, it also can kind of depend circumstantially. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like an allowable question should be, where did you get your fabulous necklace? Oh. Um, no, but um, <laughs> That's easy. so it seems like you are, other than having resident Gen Zers in your house that you can tap and their friends and so on and so forth, you're fairly plugged into what the generation wants that's led you to reduce the, hey, these common denominators for success are these four items. How did you go about doing that research and, and how should we as leaders try to, I mean, great, four things that we can apply here, but how do we try to plug into those generations other than hire a DECO or LHH, right? Thank you, yes, do that. Um, so a so, couple things. Number one, I work for a massive organization and our, our motto is make the future of work work for everyone. So we work with companies all over the globe and we do a ton of research. So some of this is backed by people other than me. Some of it is anecdotal, but, but one thing that I think that the entire world is craving, but some of us who are from older generations didn't feel permission to ask or, or we just we were raised differently in the organization. There was a woman earlier that said, you know, my family told me, put your head down and do good work. I mean, a, a lot of us, like my parents, pick <laughs> my dad, don't be the person with just five years of experience that you did the same thing. Make sure you are regularly learning and contributing. But, but I think my generation, our parents were very much like, what can you do for the company? I think COVID has changed it for all of us for all of us, we're all regularly assessing our personal lives, our professional lives, where do we fit in? Do I love this? Do I not love this? Does that matter? Um, and so from, from that perspective, I don't think it's just the folks coming out of school. I think it's everybody hates ambiguity. And so when you ask the question, what does success look like for you and for me? You don't even have to use the four things. It's just you started with the right question. What does success look like for your person that wants all this flexibility? And what does success look like for the organization? And how do we try and get those two things to come together? Another thing I would say is as leaders, there are, I have to say things all the time that people don't always like because 
that's my job is just to move the company for, forward and be a good steward of what we're trying to achieve. Anytime we say anything, statistically, 20% of the organization is going to think that it is the greatest thing that you have ever said. Oh my gosh, where have you been all, my whole life? 60% are like, we'll see if this lasts, but I could get on board if other people like it. And 20% are the vocal, we hate this. And what happens is 80% of your organization is enthusiastically on board or could get there, but you pay all your attention to the 20%. And I think, again, if you can get to a place where you're sharing, here's what the company's purpose is, here's what our purpose is, if those two things are aligned, great. If they're not aligned anymore, I think you're in the vocal minority, so let's figure out, is this even the right organization for you anymore? And I think we as companies also have to get better that not everybody's gonna stay and retire with us, and how do we offboard them so that we can onboard them again if they wanna be a boomerang? How do, how do we make this less contentious and more about a relationship? Great question, thank you. And my necklace is from a female entrepreneur. I can't say her full name correctly, but her, she goes by Maggie, and she, was, um, she worked for a fashion designer and picked up a bunch of scraps and wore a scrap home in New York, and somebody asked her where she got it, and she created her whole company from, from scraps from a design house, and now she's like a female entrepreneur, and I love supporting female entrepreneurs trying to make it, and I will get you her name. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? your great presentation and I love your point of keep adding new tools to the employees toolbox but under the current economic headwinds um, in the engineering side we are very short staffed so sometimes we, we require one engineer to do very similar projects they are they may be for different research projects but it's always like building this app or building that survey they may not be able to learn something very novel, very new. Um, how should we reconcile this with like keep adding new tools to the toolbox? So I think that um, a tool doesn't have to be that they're going to they're going to totally change their career set. I think you can have little um, micro learnings as well. So if somebody is building a new app, and my, my brother is a software developer, he worked for Salesforce for a number of years, and he does Salesforce consulting, and that is not how my brain works at all, so forgive me if I try and, exp try and come up with something that would interest him. He worked with Salesforce and was regularly trying to roll things out over and over and over again for different clients, and the best boss he said that he ever worked with talked to him about the why behind what the company was trying to do, not just from the Salesforce perspective. So when he got exposure to some clients, it made his job more rewarding. And then he did that for a little while and he was like, okay, that's interesting and thanks for adding to my tool bet that I know now how to ha I can have a client meeting or I have sat in on what the client was saying even if I didn't speak. Now maybe I want to learn more about the budget process because before it was just we don't have the budget, we don't have the budget. And so they gave him some exposure to the budget process and how many man hours went into that project and how that budget was calculated. And they even gave him some control over, do you think you can do this budget differently? What would you do? And so it didn't change his job necessarily, but it changed enormously his satisfaction. Got it. Great question. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Thanks for my LHHers in the room. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you so much, you all.